Forget everything you think you know about Spain when you set foot in the Basque country, a sliver of land on the Spanish-French border. The Basque people have a unique language, a confusing tongue that is the oldest in Europe. A rolling landscape in which green hills stretch down to the ocean, and a sophisticated cuisine in which wine is served fizzy and finger food is called pinchos. A lot of tradition, but in a place where the largest city has some of the most futuristic architecture in the world. In the next half hour, senior editor Gully Wells takes us from Bilbao to San Sebastian, explaining the intriguing culture of the Basque region of Spain. Well, if you think of Bilbao as, as the present and indeed the future of the Basque country, then Ganica really represents its historic past. Ganica is, is much more agricultural. I mean, as you can see from the market, the farmers have their fields surrounding the town and they bring their produce in every Monday. It's been every Monday since medieval times. And look at all these different kinds of beans. Aren't they great? And I like the way you can get little sprouts growing things here. Oh yeah, then you can grow them in your garden. Gully and I especially wanted to go to the market in Guernica because we wanted to have an authentic Basque experience. It was thriving and it was full of locals, which isn't like a lot of markets that you'll see maybe in southern France, say, where you're going to see a lot of tourists there. Perdón, ¿qué es eso? Paraguayos. Paraguayos. Sí, gracias. Uh, un kilo, por favor. Paraguayos. Oh, I have to take some back. I don't have any more money. <laughs> um, lo siento. Because they care a lot about food, as you see. So Maria Lozano is a professor at Madrid University who spent her summers as a child in the Basque country, and she accompanied us today in Guernica. You know that the Basques are a people slightly different from the rest of the peoples in Spain since the Romans and Islam and the Arabs never came this way. And so from the Middle Ages onwards they had their own system of liberties and freedom and they had kept very much to their own customs and their old habits and they are great defenders of what is they, they, they consider their own system of life. There was an added poignancy to Gully's and my visit to the market in Guernica because in April 1937, the Nazi saturation bombed this town. And, you know, these, this was a town that was full of people who'd come down for the day, for market day, from the hills. And more than 1,600 people were murdered that day. Franco, who was a fascist, enlisted the help of his ally, who would be Adolf Hitler, and it suited Hitler just fine to use Spain as a sort of dress rehearsal for his bombing of civilians during the Second World War in Europe. Franco particularly hated the Basques because they had, for all these centuries, maintained their independence from Castile, which was the center of power in Madrid. So he was determined to obliterate Guernica, which was the uh, center of their independence. The reason why Guernica is so important, or has been traditionally so important to the Basque people, has to do with a tree that's uh, in, in the middle of town. The old tree, the old oak tree, the symbol of all the liberties of the Basque country. They used to gather here. They have been meeting here since the Middle Ages, people of the different lords from the different villages to discuss the matters of common law. And it, it survived the bombing Amazing. Right, Look at in it, 1937. Yes. Even more something. symbolic that it, that, that symbolic. it wasn't destroyed mm. when the Germans bombed mm. by some miracle. Yeah. Well, after Franco died, democracy was restored to Spain. And along with democracy in Spain came uh, the Basques regaining uh, most of their semi-autonomous rights. Of course, the Basque country is, is not autonomous. It is semi-autonomous. And that means that they have their own legislature, they can determine their own laws governing taxation. The downside of the Basque, there's many, many great things to be said for them, of course, but the downside is ETA. And this is the violent end of Basque separatism. They want to be totally autonomous. They want the Basque to be a separate nation. And sadly, 
they are willing to use very violent means to accomplish these ends. Nationalism is a very, very strong force here. I don't think you can walk down any street here without seeing graffiti to do with independence. And, and it doesn't mean that, of course it doesn't mean that the entire population is in favor of using these horrendous methods. I should imagine that only a small percentage are in favor of using terror, terrorist techniques to achieve this end. San Sebastián is a beautiful seaside town on the Bay of Biscay. It has one of the most splendid beaches in the whole world, right in the middle of town, not unlike Rio. And it's famous as a seaside resort, but it's also incredibly well known for its restaurants. Teresa Barranachea is a great friend of mine who has a wonderful Basque restaurant in New York. She's from Bilbao and she's famous in America for serving the best Basque food you can eat outside of the Basque country. So Teresa took me to her favorite bar in San Sebastián. It's called Begara, and it's won many, many, many prizes for the best pinchas in the whole of the Basque country. And we tasted some incredibly sophisticated pinchas. Wow. This is duck. Duck, yeah. Duck with roasted apple. Roasted apples. In calvados, in a calvados sauce. Yes. And with little, little pine nuts on top. Pine nuts, yeah. yeah. Pinchos are the tapas of the Basque country. Basically, they're delightful, sophisticated little snacks that you have with a drink before dinner or before lunch. It's now quarter 10 to 12. Right. People have lunch here around 2, 1.32, 2.30 even. So maybe the ladies go to the market and then stop by here for a coffee or for a wine, depending yeah. on the hour. And a little, hour, yeah. little snack. And a little snack. Mm -hmm. That's nothing. Then afterwards you have lunch. Basques are obsessed with uh, food in any stage, like planting it, growing it, preparing it, and eating it. So it is a constant in our life. Each element taken separate probably is not distinctly Basque, but because anchovies you have in many places of the world, peppers you have in many places of the world, but the combination, how they combine it, is very very typical from here. Now, it's, I, these are my favorite. I remember having these in Spain 30 years ago. Angulas. This is a little toasted bread. Mm -hmm. There's a green pepper. Fried. Fried the pepper. Mm -hmm. On top, uh, there is a an marinated anchovy. Oh, I see, yeah. Then comes a slice of hard-boiled egg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then come the angulas. The ang angulas are tiny little baby eels. The light, little tiny are? baby eels, yeah. They are very, very costly and for the Basques and in general for, for Spaniards. Well, I think we might need a little more chacolí. You want more chacolí? I think so, don't you? Okay. Last there it is. Chacolí, I think, is probably the most classic white wine of the Basque region. It's only made in this particular part of Spain. Very light white wine, slightly uh, fizzy, you know, tiny bit of bubbles in it. Yes, you can taste a little bit like champagne, but I mean, Basque champagne? So it? No. <laughs> you cannot say cham champagne. No, for I know. I'll be arrested by the French. I know. I know. <laughs> As, as in Bilbao, San Sebastián has its old quarter where the streets are incredibly narrow and there are just one beautiful pincho bar after another. I've been with Gali, I've been in Spain with her a couple of times, several times, uh, but I don't think that we've been bar hopping. There's not one woman in here, so we're going to okay. It's lots of fun. You meet people, you, you sort of get started in conversation with strangers, which for us it's uh, sort of the common thing to do. It's a, this, this group is a, this four friends. Yeah. The four of them are widowers, uh -huh. and the four of them are over 70. No, impossible. Four of them. And my friend here, me, um, me tia, me tia, uh, is also 70. <laughs> Instead of having dinner, what we did was just 
wandered down these streets, had a drink here, a drink there, a pincho here, a pincho there. And that's probably one of the most amusing ways to spend an evening in San Sebastián. That one is not so good. I don't like the lighting in there. I'm not going in no, there. I know, I know. We ran into a friend of Teresa's who was a member of one of these famous gastronomic societies, which I've heard about, but I'd never ever thought I'd get to see one because they are exclusively for men. But Teresa, in her inimitable way, persuaded Jesus to take us along to his society. Yes, there must have been about 20 men. There they were sitting down, having just finished what looked like a divine meal that they cooked themselves. They go shopping for the food, they plan the menus, they cook the food, of course they eat the food, and um, I don't believe they do the dishes. Oh, oh Donna, give it to me, please. Okay. I, I know my place, I know my job. <laughs> gracias, you. gracias. De nada, de nada. Here I go. and God created woman to be in the kitchen. <laughs> then they even started sing some of their traditional Basque songs. It was just magical. icon Ernest Hemingway took macho holidays such as safaris and deep sea fishing. But his well-known hero, Jake Barnes from the novel The Sun Also Rises, came to posh San Sebastian for his seaside relaxation. In real life, the crowd here is just as intriguing. Since 1885, the Spanish royal family has made its summer home here. For Condé Nast Traveler, I'm Dana Dickey. For more information, please contact our website at www.cntraveler.com. To order home videos or DVDs of this or other programs in the Condé Nast Traveler Insider's Guide series, visit our website at www.cntraveler.com or call 1-866-98-GUIDE. Funding for Condé Nast Traveler Insider's Guide is provided in part by